No, if I if I may broadly first indicate the sequence in which I propose to uh -huh. proceed. Uh, Malod, one, I will be taking, first of all, your lord, lordships through the order of reference of 13th January 21. I'll come to that, Malod. May I just indicate the, the uh, broad sequence? Second, Malod, the prayer that we are seeking in our application for clarification. Malod, third, Malod, the provisions of various statutes uh, and, Malod, the relevant provision in the Constitution insofar as, Malod, the uh, broad scope of the powers under the uh, for the armed forces are concerned. Well, the relevant passages from Joseph Shine, which I will take some time over because the entire context has to be explained. Yeah. Lot. And Malods, thereafter, the grounds on which we are seeking uh, this uh, clarification, which includes Malod, the unique position of the armed forces the impact, both real and potential, of such conduct on military discipline and security, and therefore, my lords, why this clarification becomes absolutely imperative. My lords, we will also be referring to some case law and literature. My lords, before my learned senior starts, we have an objection to the maintainability of the application. Would my lords allow me to address the objections on maintainability now, or would we... Who are you? My lords, we have filed interventions in this application itself because this has been filed by way of a clarification. So you, are, you are seeking to intervene and then raise an objection. Yes, my lords. Oh, okay. It is also in view of the fact that a clarification application. Who are you? But I mean, when you say my intervention, lords, yes. means who are you? Uh, whom do you represent? I represent an erstwhile member of the armed forces who has been proceeded against. Uh, on under the same the, ground. Yes, <laughs> Consequently, I have filed an application. Same here. So we are on for people who have been part of the armed forces who have now been sought. To be I saw this clarification to be dragged into the offensive order. Mm -hmm. On That's my true. part, yeah. on yeah. my yeah. part, would I seek your lordship's indulgence to yeah. appear yeah. online? I am sorry that I also, of course, I wanted to be there physically, but only on account of certain medical constraints. But yeah. I happened to be uh, a bit away. And appearing online, I I beg your lordship's pardon. But I'm that's all right. You can address us online. Don't worry about it. Yes. So let's let's begin. Let's make a point. Let's see what what where should she is going. Yes. Let's appear straight. Yes. 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 Yes.
discussing uh, in Joseph Shine, am I clear in understanding that they were only looking at the penal provisions, IPC? IPC. And they did not have uh, at least the ones that you are now proposing to put across, Air Force Act, Army Act, etc. Yes. Those provisions were not before the court? No, they were not before the court. And I must point out at this stage itself, that Malots earlier, when 497 was still on the statute books, what was happening was that in, in similar cases, uh, Malots, there is a provision, for instance, under the Army uh, Act, Section 69, which talks of civil offences. Civil offences, in other words, uh, offences which are punishable under the ordinary criminal law. Now, Malods, under such cases, we were taking it under 497 itself as a civil offence, under Section 69. Today, Malods, 497 is no longer on the statute book. And therefore, Malods, we are, there are several other omnibus provisions which are available to us, which are flexible enough to accommodate, Malods, our uh, uh, action in such matters. You are looking at the disciplinary aspect of the armed forces personnel. Uh, it's also criminalization. Also criminalization. Now, suppose what has been said. Now, because of that, am I uh, correct in understanding what Mr. Parmeshwar and this group of people are saying? That somebody who gets cleared of the disciplinary act action because of the criminal element uh, being taken away uh, is no more subject to uh, the disciplinary action uh, because of the judgment in Joseph's side? Well, what they are broadly saying is that now that, and I'm, I'm not so only. You, you may go ahead. Yes. I'm just I, sort of this. So, Malod, are, in a nutshell, what we find, because they are not the only ones, there are, Malod's, a spate of cases which have arisen over a period of time, and this judgment is from 2018, where, Malod's, we find routinely. First of all, Malod's, there has been a huge rise in these cases which has come to the fore. That Those are my instructions to Malod's, and we have given by way of illustration also. Where what has happened is that as a defense, whenever there is a, if they are charge sheeted, say under section 45 or 63, which are now, according to us, very much available to us and flexible enough to take care of such uh, uh, offenses. When they are being met with these charges, what they are saying is that Joseph Shine strikes down section 497. It is no longer on the statute book. And now, you cannot do indirectly what you cannot do directly. That is, in short, my lords, what I find routinely as a defense which has been taken in several of these matters. In the, uh, so 497 is gone and it's decriminalized and therefore even for the purposes of the armed forces, you cannot recriminalize or indirectly punish such conduct. Now, what I need to show to your lordships that insofar as the armed forces are concerned, one, I will, I'll, my lord, I'll, I'll, I'll proceed in, in, uh, in your own way. Uh, I don't, don't yes. let us, let's start. So, uh, very well, very well. I will do that because I need to show the entire context because what, my lord, 497 in a nutshell looked at was a very peculiarly structured provision. It was archaic, all of that, but it was looking at the offense of my lord quote unquote adultery in the context of marriage preserving marriage as a social institution that was the object and the object as one of the learned judges also observes was to uh, control the sexuality of the wife in order to preserve the purity of the bloodline that was my lord that archaic approach to uh, uh, um, uh, to controlling my lords the wife and therefore, my lords, this was found to be manifestly arbitrary, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and it was struck down. But, my lords, we are on a very different note. We are not so much, my lords, on the institution of marriage per se, as much as, my lord, as the armed forces who are responsible for the security of the nation. We want to show your lordships how this can impact the operational efficiency and readiness of our armed forces. Because this has not been seen at all in that context. And that is what we are concerned with very simply operational efficiency, which has a direct nexus with the security of the forces, the security of the nation. 
So, my lords, it, it may because I, uh, when I look at some of the defenses which have been raised, my lord, it appears to trivialize the issue. We are not here to impose some kind of Victorian morality on anybody. That is not the, the, the that is not the purpose. And therefore, my lord, I need to articulate how we are going about this. So, my lord, that is the order of reference. May I also show the prayer now that we are, my lords, uh, on it? And I want to just clarify. One thing here, if your lordships may just look at the uh, prayer in our application. Page 27 of our application, if I may read. A. My lords have that. No. That person subject to Army Act. You're reading where? I'm reading our application, my lords, the prayer. Okay, page 27. Yes, my lords. Your lordships have that. Yes. That person subject to Army Act, Navy Act and Air Force Act by virtue of Article 33 of the Constitution of India being a distinct class, any promiscuous or adulterous acts by such persons should be allowed to be governed by the provisions of Section 45 or 63 of the Army Act, Sections 45 or 65 of the Air Force Act and Sections 54, 2 or 74 of the Navy Act being special legislations and considering the requirements of discipline and proper discharge of their duty. Now, my lords, may I just clarify one thing at the very outset, mm -hmm. that when we use the word adulterous in this uh, prayer, my lords, what we mean, my lords, in, in, a more lo in a looser dictionary sense, we are using the word adulterous. We are not using it in the sense of 497, which had a very peculiar structure to it, which I will also point out. And when we use the word promiscuous, we mean, my lord, again, in the dictionary sense, licentious. Adulterous is, of course, my lord's uh, uh, extramarital affair should be enough to take care of the meaning of adulterous for our purpose. And my lords, the expression... Uh, requirements of discipline and proper discharge of their duty is also what falls from Article 33, which I will, uh, my lords, my lords, before I take your lordships through Joseph Shine and explain that context, may I quickly, my lords, take your lordships at least illustratively through one of the acts, the Army Act, I'll take your lordships, the provisions in the others are similar, um, to show your lordships. <coughs> Well, let's please take the Army Act. Is it your uh, attempt to show that uh, though for Section 497 is uh, discriminatory towards women? Yes. This particular section, there is no such discrimination. Absolutely. Well, Lord, I mean, is so far as you are uh, absolutely, well, Lord, insofar as we are concerned, there is absolutely, well, Lord, we are looking at it as gender neutral. <laughs> And there are cases where we have gone that from your uh, reading cities. Yes, we have gone against women officers as well. And my lords, now it's a changed situation. We are going to have many more women in the armed forces. If that's a reality. And both men and women will have to acclimatize themselves to this new reality. So that's also an important reason why this clarification is required. So these are new developments. We have to acclimatize ourselves. But this is, we are not totally gender neutral. We'll show why 497 was struck down. Yeah. Lord, may I first take your lordships to section 69? Because this was mm -hmm. earlier, my lords, the course of, con uh, the, the course that was being followed was under 69 and civil offenses when 497 was still on the statute book. Why you correlate your provisions to the arms? The Army Act or the Navy Act is 497. Well, Unbecoming of an officer on moral grounds is in itself sufficient. You are not supposed to. Absolutely. Criminality is something different. 
No, my lord, that is also, my lord, for unbecoming conduct, of course, you can be cashiered. You can be cashiered. For, my lord, acting contrary to or prejudicial to military, good order and military discipline, my lord, it is, it can be, uh, uh, there is a mm -hmm. in imprisonment term. So, my lord, I need to establish all that when I take your lordships through that as to why, why do we want to, why do we need to criminalize this kind of conduct? Because today the message that has gone down is that insofar as the armed forces are concerned, now that 497 is off the statute books, it is regarded as... Ivan, you're the commanding yes. When we talk about 497, it is based on gender, man or women. Nothing to do with your official status. Correct, absolutely. Nothing to do with your official status. <laughs> now, this court test on the anvil of the requirement of the constitution, reference to 497. It has nothing to do with your status, whether you're in army or in, in civil services or anywhere else. Correct. So, this is in the broader aspect. Yes. If you filter down, say sorry, in each persons who are serving in my organization are to be tested as per the provisions of this organization with respect to their conduct. Right. You will be right in saying, subject to what they say. But if you ask them, sorry, even if 497 has been struck down by this court, but as long as you are serving my institution, 497 will remain as a part no, of we are not system. saying that. We are not saying that at all. We are saying... Yes, 33 there. We are not seeking to punish them, my lord, under section 497, the erstwhile provision. We cannot do that. That's off the statute book. All I'm showing your lordships is that it was a civil offense. It was on the statute book at the relevant time. We used to go under section 69 oftentimes in such cases. That's what I want to show your lordships. But today, there are other provisions on the statute book which are flexible enough uh, to cover such situations of various different kinds of either unbecoming conduct or a, a conduct which is contrary to military order and, and discipline. Please see, Malot, 69 first. 69. Yes, 69 first. Malot, I'm just try, trying to show your lordship the background that we went under 69 earlier. Now we are going under a different provision, okay. civil offences. Lord, civil, army, act. army Act, Army Act. Civil offences, your lordships might note, is a, uh, uh, defined yes, under section 3 into brackets 2 of my lords, the same act. Civil offence means an offence which is triable by a criminal court. So, for instance, my lord, 497 was, it was a civil offence. Now, please see 69. Subject to the provisions of Section 70, any person subject to this Act who at any place in or beyond India commits any civil offence shall be deemed to be guilty of an offence against this Act and if charged therewith under this section shall be liable to be tried by a court martial and on conviction be punishable as follows, that is to say, if the offence is one which would be punishable under any law in force in India with death or with transportation, he shall be liable to suffer any punishment other than whipping so and so, so and so. In any other case, he shall be liable to suffer any punishment other than whipping assigned for the offence by the law in force in India or imprisonment for a term which may extend to seven years or such less punishment as in this act mentioned. Now, my lords, this was, my lords, it, it says shall which means that it was uh, uh, mandatory. But my lords, be that as it may, now that uh, uh, section 497 is off the statute books, we now look at my lords for 45 and 63. These are two provisions. Please take 45 and I will be my lords at a later stage dwelling a little bit on what this really means and what is the purpose of section 45. Please see 45 unbecoming conduct any officer this applies my lords to officers any officer junior commissioned officer or warrant officer who behaves in a manner unbecoming his position and the character expected of him shall on conviction by court martial if he is an officer be liable to be cashiered or to suffer such less punishment as in this act mentioned 
and if he is a junior commissioned officer or a warrant officer be liable to be dismissed or to suffer such less punishment as in this act mentioned. So 45 is one of the provisions under which we charge officers for what is regarded as unbecoming conduct or something uh, um, which is out of line with the character which is expected of him. Miller, this is primarily because he's an officer. He, he or she would be required to display a certain standard of conduct which is more rigorous and exacting than an ordinary person. And therefore, that was the purpose, but I shall dwell on this also further a little more because I need to show that why, are, why do these provisions exist? Why are they, Lord, in the, in the, the other side says that these are very vague provisions. It is required to be flexible and I will point out why this flexibility is required. Well, let's please see further, 63, 63, violation of good order and discipline. Any person subject to this act who is guilty of any act or omission, which, though not specified in this act, well, Lord, please note this, though which not specified in this act. So as of today, my Lords, 497 is not specified in this act. Adultery or a, 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 a extramarital affair may not be specifically mentioned in this act, which though not specified in this act <clears throat> is prejudicial to good order and military discipline shall on conviction by court martial be liable to suffer imprisonment for a term which may extend seven years or such less punishment as in this act mentioned. Now, my lord, the other lesser punishments are, for example, you may lose your rank, you may be, uh, my lord, uh, uh, you may lose your position, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are many other lesser positions. But my lord, what I want to uh, emphasize over here is that it is any conduct which is pre prejudicial to good mm -hmm. order and military discipline can be malods punished it's a, it is still a criminal offense it has to be a criminal offense if it is any act or omission an act or omission not specified in this act which is prejudicial to good order and military discipline yes. yes this court after examining in totality the provision has been held to be violative article 14 and 15 yes now the question is in your organization, you want to maintain some moral purity in, in, uh, in the officers. Do it. No, I would not put it like that and I'll explain why. Yes, yes. But once the provision has been struck down. Yes. On the anvil of the constitutional uh, uh, basis, then your subordinate legislation under the Army Act or some act would not come out by say, sorry, this provision may be not be unconstitutional. But my uh, subordinate legislation. So not subordinate legislation is, at all. Is that, is this, is it this is not a, subordinate. Something which is unconstitutional. You can only say your saving clause now. This is nothing but saving clause. To your organization. No, my lord. Then, no, no, no. no. What, what else, please say. What you want to express no, to my us? Lord. It is just a saving of no, your organization, not no. within the ambit of the, the verdict of this court holding to unconstitutional. My lord, please see. I, I will have to. Show. Under your army, yet if you want to take action, take, take the action. That is what we need. To, we, we are proposing to do. Who is coming forward then? Milo, somebody test. That's the, the court. point. That is, it tested. No, my lord. That is the whole point. What we cannot. What has happened is this, please. Uh, and why we need the clarification from this court and from a five judge bench. And that is why the three judge bench will not felt it necessary. It did not simply dispose of the matter and say you decide in individual cases. Let it be decided. Why, my lord? One. After 497 uh, being struck down, there has been a spate of cases where all sorts of Malod things have come to, to light and are being Malod either they are in, in the process of being uh, Malod, those officers are being charge sheeted or it is already in court martial or it is before the AFT. It is pending Malods in various at various levels and at various stages. Some they may not have been charge sheeted at all. 
Now, Malod, the message that seems to have gone through, and I think, Malod, I need to elaborate a little bit on this, that now this conduct that is an extramarital affair by either an officer or any personnel in the armed forces is permissible conduct. It is, it is now because of Joseph Schein, which Malod, it takes it much further than just gender uh, parity. I, I need to point that out. In fact, some of them, Malod, can be misinterpreted. Now, it, the, the sense is, the message that has gone down that this is permissible conduct, it has nothing to do with military discipline, and because it is permissible by no less than a constitutional bench of this uh, court, therefore we cannot, we as the armed forces cannot punish you for such conduct. Now, Milods, there is, what happens is, why do we have court martial? Why do we have our independent criminal justice system in the armed forces? Because we need to act quickly. That's why, Malod, we do not, we, we have a choice of either, you know, if you, there's, a, uh, there's a civil offense, we can go under the regular uh, criminal justice system. But oftentimes, we choose not to because we need matters to be decided quickly. These are matters of discipline. So therefore, we go, Malod, uh, we go, the whole idea of a court martial and having a separate system is to ensure that speedy, uh, that, that certainty of outcome, immediate outcome. Now, what happens is this, when matters are pending all over the country, at different units, this is happening, it is disturbing, Malod, the cohesion of units, and I need to dwell on this for some, Malod, uh, I need to elaborate this. When all this is happening, Malod, look at the chaos that it is taking place, look at the uncertainty it is breeding, and it leaves us completely powerless to do anything, because every time, Malod, there is a charge sheet, there's a quashing application, our officers are running from pillar to post to try and uh, to defend it. Sometimes, Malod, in one or two cases, yes, we have succeeded in saying, but the well, look at the rounds of litigation. There's a charge sheet. Then you uh, um, uh, you defend it. Then Malods, the order is passed. Then it goes back again into the court martial. So Malods, this is not a good thing for for the armed forces. Which the whole purpose is that a court martial has to work quickly and efficiently. Now, if we are going to be uh, paralyzed at this, that, that's why it requires a clarification. You are testing uh, your organization alone. You are testing in totality. M Malod, I, I will see, deal with all of the man serving in a some uh, civil service. Yes. Is that man is not supposed to maintain that standards of morality? No, he is. You are expecting. Malod, I am not. Malod, I have not opened my case on morality. I have not opened my case yet on morality. So please, Malod, I would request your lordships to just allow me. Is Malod, what is unbecoming us, conduct? <laughs> what is I, I? I have not opened my case on that. So please, Malod, allow me to do that, and I will. I will make my case good. It is not so much about Malod morality, Victorian morality, and all of that. My case is purely and simply, my lords, on what is military readiness, operational efficiency, which impacts our security. We are only on that, my lords, and I will show why all this adds up and how it can have a serious impact. I have had a discussion with the officers on this. There have been real cases where this happened. Let me let me explain that, my lords, straight away well, before I go to just one minute. Now that she's pressing the application. Of course, I am. Yeah. Would your lordships, would your lordships first hear of an objection? Because there's something substantial to see on the objection. Because in the normal course of matter of this season is referred on issues. Since this is, there is no issues that have been formulated here, we had certain substantive objections on the very maintainability of the application. Now, that before she gets into the merits, I would want to appraise your lordship of what are objections on the maintainability are. And we are not shying away from an adjudication on merits, but I think this is a matter where your lordships must first. Understand what at the outset, what are objections on the maintainability of the application itself is. But we must also understand why they are coming here with that clarification petition. She's explained that she's the no, I haven't, I haven't opened your it. objection, but what exactly is their case? That the prayer has been placed. The prayer has been placed. So I I I am entirely in your lordship's hands. The lordships want to hear our objections first on the maintainability because this is a very unusual case where a clarification See, three judges felt that. Five of us shan, sh should yeah. uh, give our That's attention it. to this problem. So already, kind of, uh, it has entered. Uh, this it was, that was because it was seeking three couldn't have anywhere clarified five. Simple for the simple reason that they shouldn't have clarified. They, they what five justices? Judges could have said that so, no, no clarification is needed. We often do it. So my lordship, it's it's entirely up 
up to your lordship to see whether your lordship saw me. You have the objections first or then get into the merits. We have seen yes, the minister. Struggle somewhat has been crossed when the honorable three judges. I'm sorry, my lord, that was ex parte. I'm sorry. With all due respect, that was ex parte. We couldn't have clarified a fine. So, <laughs> in that sense, in that sense, they couldn't have clarified a fine. They did not clarify. Their lordships did not clarify. That's right. What I'm so go through the order. No, that's exactly what I'm saying. Could have couldn't have clarified a fine. Therefore, they left to a fine. The honorable judges also did not feel that this is not a matter which requires clarity. I can only voice my concern. I mean, your lordships are completely. But they cannot offer the very object of the Army Act and the other acts. No, you should hear it. Hear yeah, them at least. No, no, I'm saying that's a merit. I'm really saying the manner in which this matter is being heard by Constitution, that why it should. A section which is not even under challenge is being brought in a preemptive strike to use a military parlance. Yeah, Hearing them doesn't it. mean that uh, the automatically there will be a clarification. Question is whether it requires no, some clarification or not. So let them present their case. Why you are standing in the way of uh, their no. presenting the matter? I'm I'm obliged. Well, uh, before I take my lords to this whole morality issue, uh, which I do want to disabuse my lords of, but I just want to point out Article 33 so that it becomes clear that there is also my lords a lot of case law on Article 33, which at a later stage I will refer to. But my lords, insofar as the armed forces are concerned. They are a class apart. They are a class apart. So even Lord, on moral standards relating to other matters, there is a different set of standards which is expected of the armed forces. Please see. Yes. Well, the Constitution, Article 23. Power of Parliament. Power of Parliament to modify the rights conferred by this part in their application to forces, etc. Parliament may by law determine to what extent any of the rights conferred by this part shall in their application to A, the members of the armed forces or the members of the forces charged with the maintenance of public order or persons employed in any bureau or other organization established by the state for purposes of intelligence or counterintelligence or person employed in or in connection with the telecommunication systems set up for the purpose of any force, bureau, or organization referred to in clauses A to C, be restricted or abrogated. My Lord, please note these words. So, my Lord's fundamental rights can be restricted or abrogated so as to ensure the proper discharge of their duties and the maintenance of discipline among them. Now, this has been interpreted, my lords, uh, several judgments. I will show that uh, at a later stage. But let me, my lords, at least now elaborate on what Joseph Shine was about. What is that context? What are we concerned with? And is the compelling state object the same over here? Does it not require a clarification which will put to rest because it is impeding our ability to take disciplinary action within the armed forces? It, it impacts our security concerns. And therefore, my lord, to ensure proper discharge of duties. Now, my lords, so therefore, my lords, just this was just to mention it at the outset that ultimately this is a class apart. The case law is very well settled. Armed forces, they form a class apart. And there is, my lord, fundamental rights are, can be restricted. My lord, they are restricted. Even the right to privacy is restricted for ordinary civilians. But apart from those restrictions, there are other restrictions which apply because of you know, the nature of their duty is very simple. Why can't you take us through the objects and reasons of the Army Act also? It has some I'll, relevance. I'll, 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 some relevance. I, may I do that? Please go through. Certainly. I'm grateful. Especially after 15th August 1947. Yes, this That's came in 1950. Yes. Because, uh, may I read the SOR? The Army Act. Statement of Objects and Reasons. 
The need for a general revision of the three acts, namely the Indian Army Act 1911, the Indian Navy Discipline Act 1934, and the Indian Air Force Act 1932 has been felt for some time past. Some of the provisions of the existing acts were already coming out of date and insufficient for modern requirements, but after 15th August 1947, the need for revision became imperative for obvious reasons. It was therefore decided to revise all the three acts with a view to making them self-sufficient and complete codes in themselves. I'm, I'm so grateful to my Lord. The object was to make them as closely similar in form and arrangement of matter as the special requirements of each service might demand. Although the revision of the Army and the Air Force Acts has been completed, this has not been possible in the case of the Naval Act. The present Naval Only Discipline... Only the first portion, that is the main thing. Yes. Okay. Well, self-contained code, your logic is absolutely right. And in fact, when we discipline for good order and for military discipline, it is a form of self-regulation where only the armed forces can completely appreciate and understand what can lead to a trigger which can be a breach of military dis uh, discipline, which can impact security. And therefore, it is a self-contained code. It is a, this is self-regulation at a certain level. My Lords. Now, my Lords, just coming to just a preface which I want to make to Joseph Shine. What Joseph Shine dealt with. And then, my lords, I will explain the, the morality and the standards aspect insofar as, uh, my lord, the armed forces are concerned. My lord, may I preface my arguments insofar as Joseph Shine is concerned by saying two things broadly. One is that, my lords, the court was concerned with a peculiarly worded provision where the court was really looking at it in the context of the institution of marriage. The important thing that I want to say here, my lords, is that the court was not concerned. It was not concerned with the impact of an extramarital relationship in the context of a a workplace or a work culture and certainly not in the context of a work culture as unique as the armed forces. So we were, my Lord, Joseph Shine was in the context of the institution of marriage and not in the context of a work culture. Two, my Lords, the compelling state interest which eventually led to the striking down of 497 was that it was not only concerned with preserving marriage and therefore it could not be criminalized it is it was recognized as a wrong it was recognized as deception etc cetera, etc cetera, as a ground for divorce that all, all that the court preserved but what it said was that ultimately this is patriarchal, it is out of sync with the times, and the idea, the object, the compelling state interest was not only preservation of the institution of marriage, but to preserve and to, to control, to control the sexuality of a wife so as to preserve the, the purity of the bloodline. That was as a lot archaic as the provision was. It, it was in the AMLO 1800, and that's what Justice Chandrachur actually observes in the that it, the idea was to preserve the purity of the bloodline and therefore control the wife. So, my lords, this is not the prism that we are concerned with. Our compelling state interest is going to be military discipline. It, of course, I will show how it can both really and potentially impact military discipline. That I will show. But Malod, that is what I want to just preface Joseph Shine by saying, and ultimately, Malods, what the court found that this is 497 is such an illogically framed provision because it the the the, the wife of the Malod, the adultering man, she cannot be an aggrieved person. She could not the, the wife of the man who was involved in the adulterous relationship could not be. Uh, uh, an aggrieved person. 
she not the other the, the wife who was actually involved in the uh, adulterous relationship she was not even an abetter she could not be an abetter either it was the man the uh, the uh, that so called adulterous man who was the perpetrator he was the seducer etc etc and it was only her husband who could complain because he was the aggrieved person because the wife was his property his chattel etc and he had the right to control her so malo we were concerned there with a very peculiarly structured provision very utterly patriarchal but malods apart from this the 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 um, it being completely gender uh, in fact anathema to to gender equality there was another aspect which is also tied up with this that the court recognized that there is a right a fundamental right to privacy that both men and women enjoy and malods i will be pointing out that there was a slightly perhaps a discordant note at a certain level between two opinions which malod i certainly see and which is that malod one opinion seems to suggest that there is privacy both within marriage your your uh, uh, the, sec- uh, the 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 right to sexual uh, choices within marriage as well as outside of that relationship with a third party as well that is what one of the judgments certainly seems to suggest so my lords whether this will also be used because that is also being used as this is our right to privacy even to have an extramarital affair whereas another of the opinion justice malotra's opinion my lords So it says that no you do not uh, enjoy article 21 protection for the purposes of an adulterous relationship so my lord there is a little bit of a discord there but eventually my lord there is there are observations which seem to suggest that in no situation other than those which have been identified can any such conduct within or outside of marriage be criminalized be criminalized so what is therefore a criminal offense what do you need to show in order to criminalize something has to be a societal interest etc and the court seems to find at paragraph 58 which i'll show your lordship that only in these situations can you criminalize uh, um, which includes my lord for instance domestic violence or dowry etc but therefore the question arises then my lord the armed forces that was never an issue in fact no work space or, or or no fallout of of an extramarital relationship in any workplace whether a civilian workplace or a uh 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 the military workplace has been taken into account at all so my lord even in ordinary my lord corporate organizations today or in a university today you have to make a disclosure for instance if the professor is in a relationship with the student or my lord in a, in in firms also you have to make even if it's not an extramarital affair is that not a uh, um, nobody questions that why because it can have an impact on the relationship if you are a professor in a extramarital of uh, a relationship or a, a relationship with your student for example there there can be bias you show so therefore disclosures are essential in those in a work in, in any other work environment as well but you know when we are talking of the armed forces when we are talking of the armed forces it is as is a very different and unique ecosystem so malod before i get into joseph shine again let me just identify those areas where this can have an impact on good order and military discipline how this can be and what what is unbecoming conduct these two provisions is there any definition of uh, unbecoming well there are some judgments uh, we have some literature on this but my lord a, a lot of the time it has been described oh it's it's vague it's rather omnibus but there is a reason why it is so because in matters of military discipline you cannot always anticipate what is going to happen so the judgments also recognize that you have to have sufficient flexibility to be able to deal with the situation that you have to deal with and what is unbecoming conduct ultimately and why do we lay so much e- emphasis on unbecoming conduct i must explain that because that this unbecoming conduct in civil 
life in view of Joseph Shen has become a becoming conduct. Well, look, I would not say that, but I would say that it cannot be criminalized. Okay. Right. So, so criminally Malod, becoming conduct. It is, Malod, it, it's it's uh, it's permissible in terms of so uh, it's not criminally. In the armed forces, we can import. Yes. Yes. I I uh, I'll, I'll address that. same uh, becoming conduct and transform it into unbecoming. Right. Right. So while you are uh, looking this judgment, science judgment, one particular portion you will have to give some advice. See, it is this. Viewed from the such scenario, the provision really creates a dent on the individual independent identity of a woman when the emphasis is laid on the connivance or the consent of the husband. Yes, yes. This stand amounts to subordination of a woman where the constitution confers equal status. So it is a husband decides. Correct. Just. Yes. Correct. Malod, I'm going to, in, in detail at a later stage, I'm going to go into Joseph Shine. But Malod, just to, I'll just be. Malod, this concept of unbecoming conduct and why um, one, as, a, as an officer, one must behave in a manner which is consistent with your position. Ultimately, it cannot be, Malod, the expression no, is correct. Had this been specified as an unbecoming conduct in your code. Maybe one course, uh, you would have been in better footing. Well, let me, let me say this. Because you are, see, something in general law has been found to be. Uh, not becoming, my lord. It is not, it is no, still not. I, I, my lord, not, uh, not a criminal conduct. In yes, it is not criminal. So, so my lord, may I say this? So, but the civil, uh, so let me let me say element this. of rights uh, kind of no uh, what happens my lords in the army very it's a peculiar and a unique ecosystem and why that that we understand yes we no, so i i the, need to elaborate we why to look at the code right whether code permits you independent of joseph shine judgment yes, yes. that's what we are looking at right <laughs> my Lord, I'll, I'll address your logic my Lord, but please bear in mind that merely because Joseph Schein decriminalizes adultery as understood in 497. Possibly still not, it's a ground of divorce under... It's still... So, Malaj, if it is a ground for divorce and it remains so, it is it is recognized as a wrong. It is it is a... Necessarily, it's recognized as a... Uh, as a breach of for trust. Resolving the it can be... Malod, it it is it would be certainly I would say that it is still uh, uh, it is infidelity it may not be criminalized for the ordinary civilians. It's not a civil wrong also. It's a ground of divorce. Malod, it's a ground for divorce. It's an act of infidelity. It's, it's not an a act, It could be an act of breach of trust. It is not a tort as yet. Uh, Malod, it has to be tested. I, I I have not applied my mind to that aspect, frankly. But it it, are, it has to be a specific. It is certainly wrong. not becoming conduct. For anybody. That's regarding tortious part, you know, tortious part, there is only one reference, you know, in the Joseph Shein judgment, referring to a South African judgment, which said even compensation one is not endated to. But in Joseph Shein, it was not we gone into not further at all. We, need, we may not be in tandem with the value system of South Asian, uh, South African yes. jurisprudence, yes. but of course we have to we have to tune it with the global. Correct, absolutely. That that exercise has been done in Joseph Schein. The global scenario was well gone into, but the question as to whether it is a torch, it will amount to inf whether infidelity will amount to torch. We are not entering into that. Point that uh, we pose this question only to understand whether Correct. it is a civil wrong. Yes, yes. The, that was the, not the, the, under the statute. statute. It was, the infidelity was found to be a moral wrong in Joseph Shine, but the compensation aspect was not decided in Joseph Shine. That's what I would say. There is a reference to certain okay. other jurisdictions yeah. only to indicate that. But that we was not pinpointed. Uh, yes, yes, yes. What is passing through our mind so that you can modulate your... Right. Yes. Lord, therefore, my Lord, I started by saying that we need to, my Lord, take this prism off of Joseph Shine in the sense of because it was not considering neither any workplace or work culture, the fallout of an extramarital 
relationship in the context of a workplace. We are talking of what, my lord? We are talking of military discipline. So therefore, whether it is becoming or unbecoming in the civilian context, in the in a home, etc., is no concern as far as this is concerned. We are concerned with this, my lord. Please see how it can have an impact. There are two provisions I showed. One is 45, which talks of unbecoming conduct and of acting in a manner which is maybe inconsistent with the character which is expected of an officer. And the second is, my lord, prejudicial to, my lord, military discipline and good order. That is 63. Yes, 63 and 45. There are two separate provisions. And there are similar provisions in the other acts as well. Now, my lords, please. Uh, one, uh, yes. Just a, yes. Uh, different way of looking at it. This comes to 497. Yes. Whoever has sexual intercourse with a person who is and whom he knows or has reason to believe to be the wife of another man without the consent or connivance of that man, such sexual intercourse not That's amounting right. to the offense of rape. That's right. Now, you take a situation where a person in the army, army officers, he has an extramarital affair with wife of somebody and the that the husband of that lady she has no objection he has no objection he consents he connives it remains however an extra matter ago so will it be an offense under section 497 not under 497 it may not because it has it not be Yes, but, but under my be, law, yes. Under your law, will it not be absolutely reprehensible conduct? Absolutely. Yes. Because, very simply, suppose he is an officer. Yes. My Lord, there are people under his command. That's it. Now, my Lord, in the army, the most important factor, which I am emphasizing here, Character. the cohesiveness of the unit, the bonhomie and the fraternity of the unit has to be kept together. Yes. Now, Melos, these are persons who under your command have to be so willing to saying. do or die. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Correct. Correct. So, so Melos, under if, if, if they find that here is a man who is having an affair with somebody who was in any kind of inappropriate relationship, Unless you can inspire that awe and that respect in your those who are under your command, they may not obey you. It can therefore lead to. You notice that this man is having a notorious, is having an experimental. Yes. Effect. The husband is also, you know, he's not concerned. Correct. He's having, he's consenting. So it's not an offense under 497. So Correct. It, so it will, you will still be able to proceed under your. Body. Correct. But, my lords, there may be cases where it is, it would have been an offence under uh, 497, but I can still proceed under my law. Because, my lord, it's a simple thing that if, my lord, there is a certain, um, my lord, a cohesiveness which is attached to a unit in the armed forces. And, my lords, here is a situation where people have to be able to do or die at your command. It requires a very different type of psyche and a mindset to get people to ultimately my lord conform and to follow your commands at a flash now if you do not if you do not command the requisite or oh, and that's where the expression officer and a gentleman today we will say officer and a gentlewoman as well but lord, that it? is how no no no, no. Can yeah. I don't interrupt now let them let us yes, so, Mila, this is the concept of an officer and a gentleman. What is that character which is ex expected of you? It has to be more rigorous, more exacting than any ordinary person, even a person serving under you. You have to set that example. If you think they are ready to lose, they have to be ready to lose life and limb at your command. So, therefore, my lords, in that context, the command structure, which is the most sensitive thing in an army organization, the command structure gets disrupted, disturbed. If you see one, you see that your commander is behaving in an in inappropriate manner without a care in the world, one. 
he, whether he's intoxicated, he's in an inappropriate relationship, whatever the, uh, the unbecoming conduct is, it's not conduct which is expected of, of, of such a person. It, it is likely to lead to not just insubordination and a breach of military discipline, but it can actually imperil our security concerns if they refuse to act upon his orders. That is point number one. Secondly, my lords, it can also have an impact this way, unbecoming conduct. Please see, suppose there is a person in a commanding position and with his subordinate, he is in an extramarital affair or some kind of affair, even if it is not extramarital, my lord. Please see this. If your unit members who are supposed to function as one body, one group, one complete cohesion and adherence, if they feel that you are going to favor this person or there is some favoritism being shown because of a relationship you are in. Again, my lord, this can trigger off, my lord, nothing less than a mutiny. It has happened. It can trigger off something very serious. And here, my lords, we are in situations where you may be serving out there, you may be living together in barracks, you may be serving in some very arduous uh, situation, you may be out in a submarine for months on end, if you have a situation and your people under your in your unit are not willing to obey you because you have acted in a manner which is unbecoming, then, my lords, it's a very serious security concern. Very serious. So, my lords, we are, I, I would not overemphasize the morality bit. You omitted to I say would, one thing. I'm you sorry. said that uh, they are to work as a unit. Yes. With the... Uh, a single might. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And if I may just elaborate. That is a success of. Absolutely. In fact, my lord, what the literature on this, and it's very interesting, I also learned something from it, which is, my lord, in a, in an, uh, a unit in the armed forces, there is a certain surrender of your individual instincts, of your individual uh, idiosyncrasies, of your individual affections, because what is the unit demanding of you? It is demanding, my lord, a collective identity, a complete coordination, what my lord, Justice Chandrachud in, in, in one of the judgments refers to as esprit de corps. That is the spirit. It's a living spirit of the unit. You cannot, in fact, my lord, in fact, symbolic of this is one, is the uniform which you put on. Which is, which is meant to make you not just that you stand out in a crowd, but that you are one like anybody else. You're members of a unit. You're supposed to act at somebody's command in a flash. You do not question those orders. Everybody else, my lord, in civilian society, we question everything. We, we show our individual identities. We wear our uh, uh, diversity perhaps on our sleeve, but you cannot do that in an armed force. You have to act. When you are told to act, you have to be, be willing to give up your life if you are told to do that and to kill, of course. So, my lords, what is it that mindset that is able to, you have to have enormous respect and awe for the officer commanding you and you yourself as a part of the unit, you have to act in complete coordination, complete synchronization. So, one symbol of that, my lords, is the uniform. Another symbol of it is, my lord, for instance, on, on Republic Day only last week, we saw how, how the regiments, my lord, when they march together, that is also symbolic. Why is it that every limb, every cell of the body almost is, my lord, acting in complete synchronization? What is that meant to symbolize? It's not just a routine exercise. It's wow. meant to not create that, that spirit. We respect. But at the same time, you do test on the anvil of what has been said by this court. See, we respect our army here, the way they are dealing with, they are giving security to all of us. Nothing wrong in it. But we have to examine in the anvil of the mandate now given by the court here. And now you see Article 33, once again. You see Article 33, uh, this is an amendment made in 1984. Well, the amendment was made, and that is, armed forces, it always applies, but the other... Now, what we are requesting you, if you see, the parliament may by law uh, determine to what extent any of the rights conferred by this part, that is part B, shall in their application to leave it, be restricted or abrogated. Yes. Now show us, under Article 33, which are the rights available, which can be either restricted or abrogated? Lord, all rights in, in can be restricted or abrogated. Yes, my lords. Lord, please see. 
what is the right here that a person can class. Milord, please let me just, for instance, Milord, in the case of an, an extramarital affair, what is the right that some uh, that an ordinary civilian can claim? He can say, this is my right to privacy. You must not interfere in it. It is my right to um, um, sexual privacy, as the court has also upheld in, in, uh, uh, um, uh, in Joseph Shine. So therefore, it is maybe my article, uh, my article 21 right. It may be my right of expression, 191A, whatever. Malad, in even in the case of a civilian, ordinary civilian, if there are security interests which are at stake, for instance, in any given case, you can't claim your 21. It can be curtailed so long as there is a law, there is a legitimate state interest. And so long as the procedure is reasonable, you can curtail it. Of course, you can curtail it. Therefore, my lords, in the case of armed, the armed forces, members of the armed forces, not only are the uh, regular other restrictions which are applicable to civilians and to the restrictions, other restrictions to the, the uh, fundamental rights, are those restrictions can be invoked. In addition, we have the protection of Article 33, where well, judgment after judgment holds that this is a class apart. You have, we have, well, look at what these people have signed up for. Look at the level of sacrifice we are willing to give up our lives. Somebody commands you, you go and you either you shoot or you get killed yourself. What is ultimately, well, this is a much higher standard and rigor. We cannot, well, our civilians cannot even begin to appreciate what is the level of well, what is the mindset of those people that has to be. If, if, well, it can be understood by anybody that Joseph Shine means that you can be my Lord, having any kind of affair or relationship. You know, look at the, under the Army Act, for example, a sentry who is sleeping on his post. What is the punishment? Up to 14 years imprisonment. If he's intoxicated on his post, up to 14 years imprisonment. My Lord, for a civilian, if you are found to be sleeping on your job, you will be let off with a reprimand. You may say, one may think that, oh my God, 14 years or you know, whatever imprisonment, but it is, it is therefore punishable with a jail term. Why? It's a class apart. We cannot reason with what is necessary for military discipline because we cannot even begin to you know, appreciate that level of rigor which is required. And you know, one of the articles, and that is an American article which says, a person who cannot have that much control over his individual instincts, what will he do in a combat situation? What will he do when the time of reckoning comes? It's not just, it is a very important thing that I have to set an example if I'm a commander for the rest of my unit. But other than that, I also have to have that level of mental strength of control over my instincts that I behave in a manner which is behoving of an officer or behoving of somebody who is serving in the armed forces. Now, there are many ways, my Lord, in which this kind of conduct can imperil security interests. One is simply, as I pointed out, there can be complete insubordination. You can have a mutiny if somebody feels that somebody else is being favored. I will not act because this man does not deserve my, uh, my respect. It has happened in, in, in several situations. One. Two, my lords. Ultimately, my lord, an extramarital affair, it may be an act of stealth. It may be a breach of trust. It may be... Um, my Lord, it's an act of infidelity at the end of the day. Now, if you are embroiled in that situation, obviously your alertness, your preparedness, your readiness, which you have to have, your reflexes are uh, questionable. You're not going to be in that position to act. And you know, extramarital affair is only one type of conduct which can amount to a breach or pre be prejudicial to military discipline. There are a whole lot of other things which sometimes you know, it's not an exhaustive thing. So you know, that is one aspect. The third, as I've already pointed out, is the breach of the command structure, which is you know, very dangerous, very, very dangerous. The fourth, you know, and here you know, perhaps some morality element comes out. Well, my lords, here are people who, like no other, have to leave their families and serve on a front. It may be a peace station, it may be a combat station, whatever it is. For the longest times, they leave their families and other jobs, perhaps one may say that also people have to go. But do they go with that uncertainty? Am I going to come back? Am I going to see my family again? In such a situation, my lords, if in that uh, um, my lord, situation, the, this, a member of the family or a spouse is in a relationship with somebody else. 
whether civilian officer, whatever. Malod, can can as an employer in the armed forces, Malod, can the Union of India turn back and say that I will turn a blind eye to this? It doesn't matter to me whether your family is in, in, in harmony or there is integrity in your family. Your integrity as a family, your well-being, your harmony matters to us as employers. Otherwise, we will not have people who will be willing to give up their lives and go there on the front. So therefore, my lords, we cannot turn a blind eye as employers. We have to have public confidence. They have to have public confidence in us to raise their morale so that they can fight for the rest of us. So, my lords, these are the various factors. Yes, one. So, what you are trying to say is that first and foremost, constitution itself under Article 33 yes. recognizes a different or a higher standard of benchmark for discipline. Yes. And the discipline that you expect in the domestic sphere, so far as the armed forces personnel are concerned, it has to be replicated in a combat situation also. So, therefore, there cannot be any compromise on the standard and discipline and the benchmark that you set higher, which is constitutionally recognized yes, yes. under Article 3. Yes. Plus, my Lord, as, as I have explained, it can have either a real or a potential impact on my ability to perform my duty. So, I don't even have to, my Lord, as the arm, as an employer, I do not even have to wait for, for instance, if some, say, a commander, an officer is having an affair over there, I cannot wait to see whether that actually impacts in a combat situation. Will they obey him? Will they not obey him? We don't wait for to, to that see cannot that. cannot be waiting. We cannot. We cannot afford to. If he is behaving in a certain way, if he is conducting, we have to act immediately. We have to obey because we cannot risk that uh, insubordination or that unrest in the unit. It is not a domestic affair. It's not. It's, it, it, because this is the fallout. As I said, Manoj, even in so many civilian situations, you have to disclose when you are in a relationship in an ordinary work environment. Manoj, in an army, we are talking about something so different. So, therefore, therefore, Manoj, this stands on a very, very different footing. And when even Article 33 says, Manoj, it says, Restricted or abrogated so as to ensure the proper discharge of their duties. So, therefore, we can abrogate it at the very inception we can act. When you are in an affair, if you are found out to be in an affair or whatever it is, you are intoxicated on duty, etc. We don't wait to see whether your intoxication is going to... So what you are calling upon us to do it? No, no, no. No, what you are calling upon us? I'm only calling upon your lordships to simply clarify that I am not, because of Joseph Shine, I am not precluded from acting under 63 and 45 and whatever other provisions under Navy Act, similar provisions under the Air Force Act. I am, I am in, in fully within my rights to act. Read section 497, it says that will include in this section. Now, should you see that I go detriment in 16 Kerala Law Journal and read it on divorce and then for inclusion? Contemplates a certain measure of penetration of the main organ as it were. You could have a, a, a person, army man, being in a relationship where you don't go the whole hog, as it were, okay. and you stop short, but you are engaged in conduct which the army considers is important. It's good enough for us to act. 
We just wanted to. Yes, yes. Area, gray area. Because. This judgment will not stand in the way. No, it. Yes. Yes, because ultimately, Milad, what are we concerned yes, with? Yes. We are not concerned with the purity of the bloodline. That would have some effect. We are concerned with military good order and discipline. That's right. You don't have to prove what you're trying yes. to say. That you don't have to go hold. No, no, none, none of that. Yes. Supposing you indulge in say. Um, um, oral, what is called oral sex, or whether you indulge in what is called unnatural, um, uh, with, with that, uh, with your, it's because no, that may uh, sodom, etc. That may fall sex, within sex. disgraceful conduct. Disgraceful that, conduct that, that's, that's covered by that. And so you have to be very clear what we are actually saying. Well, we are concerned in with this actual, application. Actual sexual intercourse no. covered by four ninety seven. Blood and X. The way 497 doesn't stand in the way. Yes. See, if it is not covered by 49, the ingredients of 497, you don't come under the shadow of the judgment at all. Blood, but all what if all the what ingredients if, are satisfied? What if all the ingredients in a given That's, case are satisfied? We have to consider that position only. I am, Lord, I am in my respectful submission, it will still be punishable because it falls under. A, a different offense you are saying. It is unbecoming conduct if it's an officer. And second, my lords, insofar as uh, uh, 63 is concerned, it may be prejudicial to military good order and discipline. So, therefore, my lords, it comes, it, it's a, these are umbrella, and we cannot ex exhaustively define what is unbecoming conduct. The judgments also say that, that ultimately we also, as the army, we have to have that kind of flexibility to decide what. What comes under that kind of conduct, which is which which can have an impact on, which can have an impact. I don't have to wait for the impact on military discipline. But what has been declared to be unconstitutional for the common man, to be just as a as a generality and yes. from a special class, can you actually resurrect it and it make it a, a distinct offence under the? The section dealing with general offences. Right. So, my lord, that is the reason we are here. We are not here, my lords. Ultimately, what we want your lordships to appreciate is that when 497 was being considered, your lordships were not concerned with the fallout on any work culture or workplace, let alone the army. Your lordships were not concerned with that context at all. Your lordships were concerned with marriage per se. So our, our compelling state interest is different. Are the sections we are invoking is different. They, they, they show that the object is different. Military discipline. Operational effectiveness is what we are concerned with. As an army, we should we have to act. And anything which imperils that, whether it is your drunkenness, whether it is your extramarital affair, whatever it is. Disgraceful as conduct. As you don't, uh, Disgraceful you don't, conduct. As long as you don't actually rely on 497. No, we can't. The 497 is so 497. You don't rely on 497 and it falls within the contours of a separate distinct offense under the Army Act, Navy Act, whatever. I mean, how can Not distinct, okay, why? So 63, that's what I wanted to show your lordship. You can bring it under that. This question has fallen in on many occasions under Article 22. That is a double tier point. Yes. There are last, there are last case law. Yes. Separate offense. What? Because there is a subtle distinction. Because you might think that you know they're they're overlapping. Well, look, it's 63 it says. Considered distinct offenses a large body of case law. Right. Under 22. Right. Double jeopardy. So, uh, after section 300 of the um, um, uh, CRPC, which uh, no, it would be double jeopardy if the uh, the object is the same. We are trying to tell yes, you. it's not. If you have a distinct offense, which perhaps borrows part of what is contained in 497, it would not make it the same offense. No, we are charge sheeting them under my lord 45 and 63, where we say that this is conduct, you are having an extramarital uh, relationship. And um, and because Manoj 63, please note it says it talks of a, a person who is guilty of any act or omission which do not specified in this act. It's not specified in this act. So I don't I do not need to have a specific 
uh, a provision which says that X Act is is uh, comes under 63. I can malod any act, including an extramarital affair, any communication, for example, an obscene communication, for instance, malod if it is not otherwise. All of that is there. You are free to do that. That is that is my lord. What we want. you are free to do that. My, my lords must say that because my lord, please see, it will put an end to this uncertainty and confusion. Part of the army discipline. That is what we want your lordships to say. Yes. That is, my lord, there's actually a lot of uh, literature on this. There are judgments on this. Either I can put it in the form of a written submission. Or I, I had actually intended to take your lordships through Joseph Shine. Uh, Which part you want us to? Well, actually, there was a it lot. Been yes. Been yes. A lot of international literature also on this whole idea of unit cohesiveness. I mean, and uh, did you not? Because you are government of India was a respondent because you are the author of the law. And did you not bring this aspect to the notice of the court? That is angle relating to the Army Act and well, is there anything which deals with it? The court? Not at all. And also, Milo, suddenly uh, people seem to believe that this is some kind of carte blanche or license. That's the problem. And they start raising 497, you're trying to do something indirectly, what you can't do directly. Well, it's one of the problematic paragraphs is 58. 58 at page 101. Treating adultery an offense, we are disposed to think it would tantamount to the state entering into a real private realm. Under the existing provision, the husband is treated as an aggrieved person and the wife is ignored as a victim. Presently, the provision is reflective of a tripartite labyrinth. A situation may be conceived where equality of status and the right to file a case may be conferred on the wife. In either situation, the whole scenario is extremely private. It stands in contradistinction to the demand for dowry, domestic violence, sending someone to jail for non-grant of maintenance, of filing a sec a complaint for second marriage, well, the, 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 co the court seems to come to the conclusion that only such acts can be criminalized. Adultery stands on a different footing from the aforesaid offences. We are absolutely conscious that Parliament has the lawmaking power. We make it very clear that we are not making law or legislating, but only stating that a particular act, i.e., adultery, does not fit into the concept of a crime. We may repeat at the cost of repetition that if it is treated as a crime, there would be immense intrusion into the extreme privacy of the matrimonial sphere. It is better to be left as a ground for divorce for any other purpose as Parliament has perceived or may at any time perceive to treat it as a criminal offence will offend the two facets of Article 21 of the Constitution, namely dignity of husband and wife as the case may be, and the privacy attached to a relationship between the two. So, my lords, the suggestion in this paragraph seems to be that other than, for instance, bigamy or for uh, non-grant or maintenance or for domestic violence, if you criminalize, then it is violative of Article 21. To which, my lords, my answer is, one, the court was not considering, it was farthest from the court's mind in our respectful submission, challenges that are there in the armed forces, one. And secondly, in any case, my lord, 21 can be restricted, even otherwise for civilians, 21 can be restricted, even insofar as, my lords, 43, uh, 45 and 63 clearly restricted. Then, my lords, you see further. My lord, can I take your lordships more uh, uh, in, in a little more detail through jo Joseph Shine? Because which, which part you want us to? Yes, so I, my lords, I would urge your lordships to look at some parts of Justice Chandrachur's opinion. Which that which part of the judgment really stands in the way of your proceeding under the various provisions of the Army Act? My lord, one. 
One, I've shown your lordships is 58. 58. The second, my lords, for instance, is, uh, my lords, if your lordships just sees uh, paragraph 135 onwards. 155. 135 onwards. So that's Justice Chandrachud's opinion. Please see 135 at, 130, at page 135. In 19th century Britain, married women were considered to be chattel of their husbands in law, and female adultery was subject to ostracism far worse than male adultery because of the problem it could cause for property inheritance through illegitimate children. Consequently, many societies viewed chastity together with related virtues, such as modesty, as more central components of a woman's honor and reputation than of a man's. The object of adultery laws was not to protect the bodily integrity of a woman, but to allow her husband to exercise control over her sexuality in order to ensure the purity of his own bloodline. The killing of a man engaged in an adulterous act with one's wife was considered to be manslaughter and not murder. In uh, R versus uh, Mortgage, Judge Holt felt a man is taken in adultery with another man's wife if the husband shall st stab the adulterer or knock out his brains, this is bare manslaughter for jealousy is the rage of a man and adultery is the highest invasion of property. Now, please see, so that is, my lord, the compelling uh, object of the law to preserve the purity of his bloodline. Coincided with private property. Chattel. Because, uh, Chattel. No, because the bloodline has to be preserved for inheritance. Correct. Yes, 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 yes. Ms. Then, my lord, Ms. Diwan, uh, is uh, Justice Chandrachud's uh, judgment, para 135, protecting the purity of his own bloodline. Uh, there's a biological logic. Yeah. If man were able to procreate, this paragraph will not stand. Possible. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, you know, then there are certain paragraphs on Now, my lords, uh, please come to para 147. Because uh, ultimately where this builds up to is to suggest that there is a right of sexual privacy, both in marriage and even in choices outside of marriage, even if you are married. That is what it seems to suggest. So, 147. Moving on to the effectiveness of the provision at hand, the court remarked that criminalizing adultery did not help save a failing marriage. The court remarked that it was obvious that once a spouse was accused of adultery, the consequence was generally intensified spousal conflict, as opposed to the possibility of family harmony. Existing families face breakdown with the invoking of the right to file an accusation. Even after cancellation of the accusation, it is difficult to offer emotional recovery between spouses. Therefore, the adultery crime can no longer contribute to protecting 
the marital system of family, family order. Furthermore, there is little possibility that a person who was punished for adultery would remarry the spouse who had made an accusation against himself or herself. It is neither possible to protect harmonious family order because of the intensified conflict between spouses in the process of criminal punishment of adultery. So, my lord, it's everything is being looked upon from, from, upon from the prism of marriage. How to save the marriage? Can we save the marriage by criminalizing it? That's the whole, um, my lord, approach. Addressing the concern that an abolition of a penal consequence would result in chaos in sexual morality or an increase of divorce due to adultery, the court concluded that there was no data at all to support these claims in countries where adultery is repealed, stating. Well, this is the South Korean uh, uh, law. Rather, the degree of so social condemnation for adultery has been reduced due to the social trend to value the right to sexual self-determination and the changed recognition on sex, despite of punishment of adultery. Accordingly, it is hard to anticipate a general and special deterrence effect for adultery from the perspective of criminal policy as it loses the function of regulating behavior. Now, my lords, please see, uh, finally, at the uh, middle of that page, finally, the court concluded its analysis by holding that the interests of enforcing monogamy, protecting marriage and promoting marital fidelity balanced against the interference of the state in the rights to privacy and sexual autonomy were clearly excessive and therefore failed the test of these restrictiveness. Then, my lords, come the Ugandan constitution. Please look at 152 now. My lords, on base reason. Main reason is that uh, the view is uh, was that in a civilized society, the male chauvinism has no rule. No, that is definitely the, the reason main. in the other decision. And chat women being treated. Because see the, see the uh, ingredients to constitute the offense. Yes. Adultery. It was specifically cons uh, considered. First one, sexual intercourse between a married woman and a man who is not her husband. Second, the man who has sexual intercourse with the married woman must know or has reason to believe that she is the wife of another man. The third one is important. Such a sexual intercourse must take place with her consent. That is, it must not amount to rape. Another offense. Third one, that is the main thing. Uh, the last, uh, fourth one. Sexual intercourse with the married woman must take place without the consent or connivance of her husband. After stating all these things, it was held. If a man has sexual intercourse with a married woman with the concern or connivance of her husband, he does not commit the offense of adultery. That means it is the man who decides. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. That is the point which was actually heavy critical. Right. But I only ask myself one question that suppose. So the consideration is totally different yes. in that particular right. case. Here you are, you are addressing is a totally different. So we are concerned there. with operational imperativeness, readiness. Uh, efficiency of the armed forces. That is why we use the expression male service. Yes. No, my lord, it's even, it's even decides worse. whether it is a, it would constitute an offense or not. But my lord, now that is there. Yes. Okay. Yes. My lord, suppose all these ingredients are met in a case today. Can we not still punish for military mm -hmm. indiscipline? Is it not unbecoming conduct? You may have and a disgraceful discourage, contact. It, it can be even unbecoming conduct. It can be contrary to military. Ah, that is section 45. Yes, yes, it can be. It can be. That's the point. Now, my lords, what is coming in our way over here is could possibly, because my lord, the privacy right has been elevated to such a level for civilians, my lords, which we are not, uh, uh, no problem with that. Sexual autonomy in your partner, even outside your marriage, that can this be, my lord, and this is attempted to be twisted around as a defense to my lord's uh, cases in so far as the armed forces are concerned under 45 and 63. So this cannot be elevated to that level when it concerns the armed forces. That's what we are saying. Yeah. My lord, now please see 152 for instance. Ms. Divan, there yes. may be a number of reasonings coming in different conquering judgments. Ultimately, what is boils down is that 497 has been declared to be violative of Article 451. In the context of marriage, yes. Whatever it is. Yes. It is reciting the rights of two individuals in a capacity as a married wife. 
Man and the wife. It will find, still be defined under the yeah. IPC itself. Okay. Now, what we are putting to you again and again is, it's you as in your own disciplined force, under the ambit of arms and army act or the air force act, whatever it is. If you say, sorry, I'm not examining of an individual rights of a citizen, but I am examining rights of a serving officer covered by my act, unbecoming conduct of an officer for reason one, two, and three. I am authorized to take disciplinary action or the action under the law of permissible to me. Yes. So our request to you is, if you take that action as your brother Joseph also suggested, this judgment is not coming in your way at all. I'm only because asking your lordships to simply clarify. So that's the, all. The judgment never deals with the issue. My lord, your, if your lordships say that, even that is adequate. You see, your provision 45. Unbecoming conduct. No, unless you, you must have defined somewhere what is unbecoming conduct. No, it, it can't be broadly. broadly. We, we have to, like, it has to be flexible enough. Give us a, it need a not be conduct. only a sexual uh, give us civil conduct rules. Conduct. It can be any kind of conduct. Which okay, is you have to, you can't be keep it open ended. No, you have to define what according to you is the conduct Lord, which in, you expect in our an officer working under your disciplinary Lord, force. There is a certain amount of intangibility. Civil conduct rules. <laughs> Always, you cannot, my lord, we cannot say from A to Z, these are things which, there You're are things which. You define anywhere. No, we cannot, by, def, by the, the whole idea of using such an expression is, it, there is a certain intangibility. And somebody can say that if, if my lord's for uh, 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 something so trivial or inconsequential, if we have acted, then they can certainly challenge it. They can, they, they will have a full right to defend themselves. But obviously, my lord, I also understand. Whereas you will have perhaps when man is overrun. Overrun. Okay. And he say from where you get there is unbecoming conduct. My lord, because it, it falls under a different provision. So, what we are requesting you, it may fall. You must have defined somewhere. Please ask them. What are the conduct rules, what? discipline rules under your services? Which an officer is supposed to follow. No, it's, it can't be defined, my lord, because in fact, I'll show the judgments on that. Lord, perhaps, please. perhaps you can give an answer to Justice Rastogi. Say, not walking in a straight line in the armed forces, it would be an unbecoming conduct. Although it is not a defined thing that you have to walk in a straight line. In a given situation, when you are marching, you have to walk in a straight line. So if you don't walk in a straight line, it is a breach of discipline. No, but it has to be of a, it, it has to be so out of character to invite that. Out of character for an armed person. For a, yes, yes. But suppose civilian doesn't walk in a straight line. It doesn't amount. It doesn't. That's one of the example which I gave was a sentry who is sleeping on his post. If he is drunk, if he is intoxicated on his post, it, it invites some 14, it can, I mean, not that you know, it's been done, but up to 14 years. Now, you may think that is extreme, but in, in, a, in an ordinary civilian situation, but this is what we believe. But we cannot define everything, that flexibility, in fact, judgments also recognize. That, that may be the reason to... for an action, no section 63. Because you may not be in a position to envisage everything. Correct. But that may be the reason under section 63. Yes. Yes, and this is also a classic. Therefore, classic the question case. is whether that particular prejudicial activity is uh, against the good order or military discipline. And you know, nobody has challenged the, the validity of these See. provisions in any case. So, you can even be restricted with death if you sleep in the army. Yes, my lord, it is, it is, it is. You just see section 34, section, subsection K. You sleep yes. in the army. Yes. You can be visited with the penalty of death. While on active service. Subsection K. Yes. We essentially at the time of war or alarm sleeps upon its post. Or is intoxicated. My lord, are reading 34? 34 K. 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 Yes. Because that's a need of a, you know, the force. The, well, Lord, it's in time of war. It's a time of war. In in relation, these are offenses yeah, in relation to the you, enemy. If you happen to sleep, yeah, can theoretically be visited with death. Theoretically, yes, certainly, my Lord. Yes. You sleep in the army. 
you sleep when your the enemy is at yeah, your door. You can't do it. <laughs> yes, yes. So that's why I'm a lot. Nobody is going to in a in a civilian situation. You can never. Anyway, imagine. let's come to something different. Yes. Now, what really is your problem? Because you're invoking forty five sixty three. Yes. Now. Um, you're proceeding with it, you're taking action, you're dismissing them or doing whatever you're doing with them. And Milad, it is stuck them. at so many levels because the moment a charge sheet is filed ah. under 45 or 63, immediately it is challenged. Then it goes to the AFT, then depends on what happens. So what is, it's, it's, it's this uncertainty and is delaying my entire process. So they're still serving, they can't even be suspended. In any one of the cases, as it independently reads this court, Blood. Where this court could uh, certainly, you know, clarify the potential fact of that particular case. Blood. That really does not, uh, you know, it, it's not a case covered by Joseph Chang. You have independent. Lords, I, I would, I would. Um, uh, there was one case which came up where Malods, uh, in fact, there was a limitation issue over there, so Malod that failed. But Malods, I would say this, Malods, uh, uh, very respectfully, that now Malods, that the matter was referred by three judges to five judges, Malods. This deserves to be taken to its logical conclusion. And the reason is this. Malod, we cannot afford this kind of uncertainty or this group, this kind of delays in the process where a spate of, and there are so many in the pipeline still, so many happening, so many not even Malod, uh, charge sheeted. And Malod, this puts a dampener on our uh, actions also. So we do need that clarity that once and for all, once five learned judges decide that this is, did not deal with the armed forces, my Lord, that is the end of the matter. We can act today. We may not be able to suspend. To, tomorrow, my Lord, if those officers are acting and there is insubordination in the unit, my Lord, the consequences can be in the meantime very serious. Do you want actually a kind of declaration? We want a... What an advance ruling. Yes. <laughs> my Lord, we want, my Lord, even if, we, even if your logic... Could, that. That if that this this judgment was not concerned with uh, armed forces, that that is, I think, quite sufficient. That we are free to uh, uh, act under our military discipline. That is, you know, the, uh, would be quite adequate, because everything being held up at so many de different levels, and you know, there's so much litigation. The all the persons who are parties in the individual litigation are they before us? Three of them, I think, Malod, three of them. Are here. Two of them, Some yes. Some of them are here, but not uh, one out of the many uh, we are, who are actually subject to those proceedings are here. Yes, yes, so they are. Would we not end up actually doing something behind their backs? No, Malod, the question is that they are, uh, they, your logic is only clarifying a judgment. It so happens they have come as interveners mm -hmm. and their interventions have not even been allowed. That's right. So that when we are clarifying, we are doing something behind their back. So they are clinging on um, to Joseph Shine as uh, their actual the bedrock of their defense. Because they say that this court has declared the ingredients of 497 to constitute an offense which is unconstitutional by Article 14, 15, and 21. Mm. Correct. What you are trying to do is you are sort of cloaking it, you are disguising it as a separate of because of the there is no disguise. Of the words, the unbecoming fonde, and you are saying you can package it under unbecoming fonde because it's a separate offense, and you are a workplace and you've got a different unique work culture, code, exhaustive code. Therefore, it should not apply. Lord, please see my difficulty. Please see my difficulty. Earlier, because 497 was there on the statute book, yes. I had to go under 69. That's I had to go because it was a civil offence. Now that it is not, otherwise I would have been free to go under uh, uh, the other provisions. Civil, right? civil offence. So I was also, my lord, precluded from moving under, my lord, going under in that sense 45 or 63. Today, I am doing it as I was entitled to. There are other jurisdictions in which Malod similar provisions have been invoked. It is unbecoming conduct. It has been dealt with Malod even in the United Kingdom as un unbecoming conduct. So, Malod, today, how can, uh, when a judgment was not rendered in a particular context, 
it is causing a lot serious confusion in in within the armed forces as to this needs clarity and only this court can decide that there's no question of being behind their backs my lord they will have every chance at that stage to to say that this is becoming conduct what is the problem with that they can say that no you could not have abrogated my fundamental what rights as a both say what is becoming conduct is legal conduct it is my lord it is it is not criminal conduct in a 497 497 is not criminal conduct that's all in this civilian context and and 45 itself is my lord cashier in any case it's not it's not uh, criminal 63 i am yes there is a but my lord if i am protected by an umbrella provision i cannot be precluded from from approaching uh, from taking uh, action against that and how can my lord we in the entire country there may be hundreds of people who have who are uh, um, going to be act, uh, acted against under these provisions there this is both as a perhaps a solution she found out at the very beginning which is seek shelter under 33 Yes. And incorporate the ingredient of four ninety seven as a separate offence because it will not have the protection of fourteen, fifteen, and twenty one. Milot, till Parliament can act in the matter, Milot, can we brook this kind of delay in the armed forces when we have clear provisions? We have the, there's an existing law. Milot, how can we brook this kind of uncertainty and delay in such a situation? Where the court clearly, in our respectful submission, in in, in Joseph Shine, intended something else. Clearly, it was a, it was a very different context. And today, my lord, it, it it should imperil military discipline. You know, that was not. We are facing is we don't seem to be having a cause of action. So far as this order for clarification is concerned, no court has held that because of Joseph Shine, you cannot take. Uh, step uh, under this uh, two provisions 45 and 63 well lord so in yeah. absence why should we presume that the courts will hold that you cannot take such uh, steps well lord the court stay. i'm so sorry well lord yeah and then eventually on the limit just stay if any matter if any matter is pending before this court on this there uh, was and on the last occasion when this matter had come up there was one matter however my lord on lit but my lord please see the message that is being sent out the matter goes from a three judge bench to a five judge bench and then my lord without a clarification my lord it's it would create so much confusion and how much advantage will be clarification given? what we are saying that we don't have any material which shows that joseph shine applies to Well, no, that's okay. that's good enough. So the, your lordships may simply say that and dispose of my application. It does not apply. As simple as no, that. We can't say whether it applies or not. We say we don't have any material. We just have to say that Joseph Shain was not concerned with that, section forty-five and sixty-three. Well, no, that is good enough. That is good enough. Not concerned with forty-five and sixty-three at all. And and the corresponding provisions of the other. Act. Yes. Concerned with that. What was that? That that is. Mod, Malam, that is adequate. That is that adequate. is a fact. <laughs> Malam, yeah, that's a fact. That's shall a fact. I make? Shall I now make a short reply to the petitioner, sir? Because I have told, but I was for the, I was appearing for Joseph Shai, and therefore I may. Not concerned. The court was not concerned with those provisions. Five and sixty-three. Whatever will happen in a particular case, will we have to take it on zone merit? That's what I am saying. Shall I make a very short reply? you are satisfied with that that it was not that the court in joseph shine was did not consider and was not concerned with these provisions of the uh, that that goes without saying that goes without saying can anyone have any objection to that clarification may i just i may shall i shall i now make a submission madam since i was appearing for joseph shine but before you know the interveners i may be heard we we give preference to those who are appearing question blank before this what i am submitting my lord what i am submitting you lord just bear with me for a moment let, let the lady speak first 
let her let her speak first. There is somebody in front of you, Rafa. Let her speak Can, first I, can first. I make a very short request, Madam? No, no, please. Can please. I make a very short request, Madam. I won't be taking time. I am only suggesting certain things which your lords may kindly bear with me for a short time because after all, I was preparing for the petition. But let, her, let her speak. Yes. Let the lady who is before the speak come first. Oh, okay. We'll hear you. We are not saying we're not hearing. Yes, what do you say? My lords, only two points. One, that the fact there is no need for a clarification. The judgment speaks for itself insofar as it doesn't concern. What does the judgment speak for? Does it speak for about uh, 45 and 63? It doesn't. Therefore, we are only saying my lords, that this court is not concerned with 45 and 63. Would my lords then also clarify that whether those provisions need to be invoked, needs to be decided by the armed forces in the given time? No, why should we clarify that? My lords, I'll, I will point out why. Because in this order that my lords are proposing, it's effectively the clarification that they have sought for. And they would, in that case, without a application of mine, Invoke the provisions pertaining to adultery in each case. So, my lords would allow me to. You uh, can challenge that, uh, or other, you can question that uh, uh, my lord, action. In my appropriate. Lord, in giving this a clarification of this nature. See, again, now you are asking for advance ruling that Joseph Chain applies. I am not. So, you can't do that. My lords, the premise of the arguments is on the basis that there is Article 33 that is applicable. Uh, there is no statute that has been drafted and passed by the parliament. First one to which there are provisions made for the purposes of punishing personnel for adultery. Is it becoming conduct? My lords, it for, a, for an officer it, to engage in adultery with uh, somebody, is it becoming conduct? No, my lords, it is not becoming conduct it possibly for anybody, whether that person know, is serving or others. We're not talking about adultery. We're not talking about anybody because anybody is not concerned with un, uh, unbecoming conduct. You are a member of a disciplined force with huge ramifications for you know the, the rest of the countries. You're supposed to actually guard our boundaries. If you're busy doing something else, most of the time, and if you send the kind of you know the waves down your ranks, that this is okay. And brotherhood, that oneness that you spoke about, what will happen to all that? So what you're saying is it is unbecoming content. My lords. Not becoming context. I mean, let's be very clear about it. See, at one time, one couldn't send a letter to an army officer at the field station. It had to be army post office. It continues to so be. My that word. kind of privacy rights are not, have not percolated. My lords, who are directly. restricting the rights of Joseph as a judgment, so, my lords, does not restrict the rights of the husbands who are serving. We are not on, so far as army is concerned, Joseph Shine did not consider the provisions of this 4563 and equivalent in the other two laws. Yes, so, if we just record that, then you fight your own battle uh, whenever uh, unbecoming conduct uh, question is raised and you are arraigned for having committed that unbecoming conduct. My learned in fact, huh? that is arrested again. If that is alleged and they're forming a part of a charge against you, definitely can. Would that, is there a necessity to go to 45 and 63, my lord? 46 provides for disgraceful conduct, my learned friend, the manner in which it was. We won't do this, no, because we are not dealing with individual cases. There is a constitution main judgment which has come. Army feels, the defense forces feel that the judgment is being construed kind of tie up their hands in dealing with disciplinary action against their officers. What we are contemplating saying is that Joseph Shine does not deal with, um, uh, has not dealt with the army laws and so there is no clarification on that count is needed. Let the individual cases be contested in their own merit because again as my uh, senior brother pointed out, 497 is only concerned with intercourse. Yes, my lords. 497 the is only... unbecoming contact may be of wider ramification. I appreciate that, my lords, and I agree. All that I am saying is let that not be used to reinstate 497 by separately classifying or we are not saying that also. So what part of 97 is used, whether it's a platonic relationship is prohibited or not. We are not 
197 yeah. as a concept after it has been set aside by my lords, there cannot be a situation that it can be reinstated only for a class of persons, whether there is a classification available. Cross. That is all that I'm saying, my lords. That it should not be a way for reinstatement of 497 because that issue, my lords, is not considering today. No, because Joseph Shine also did not consider that issue. Because that issue, my lords, doesn't arise. May I just explain? If it doesn't arise. Then why are you so concerned? Because it would be a way. You you want to. I am not asking for an advanced ruling. All that I wish, I am requesting my lords for clarification that yeah, my lords may consider incorporating that each of these cases may be dealt with on the. So you are also seeking a clarification. If there is a clarification to the effect, my lords, that 497, the impact of Joseph Shine would there would be no impact of the judgment of Joseph Shine on the persons to whom Army Act, Navy Act, and Air Force Act applies. Then each of those cases might have to be looked at. In the context of whether the conduct actually is unbecoming or not, because unbecoming conduct has to be has to relate back. It has to relate back to the services. What is your name? Ananya Ghosh. Ananya Ghosh, can we come to the prayer in the clarification? What they have saw is something um, a little bit more uh, expansive. Yes, ma'am. To uh, so that's a person subject to so and so being a distinct class, any promiscuous or adulterous act. Should be allowed to be governed. So, if we are not saying that, we are only saying that Joseph Shahid was concerned with what he called it, 43, and the court was not concerned with 43, 63, other provisions of the army. And we leave it there. How can you say that we are doing anything by way of? The interstating we are putting. No, my lords, I am not saying that my lords are reinstated. And I since you are. I am apprehensive. I think it is not becoming gone there. Whether a set of. You have not yet made up your mind whether it is becoming gone there. Let me be very clear. Whether uh, the judgment itself recognizes that there is a moral wrong that attaches to an adult just. Whether such moral wrong is unbecoming conduct and that scope, I agree with. Mrs. Devan is very wide and it needs to be wide because it has to ad address circumstances as they come. It is not possible for the armed forces or the defense, the Ministry of Defense to set out certain circumstances and define it categorically to say that these are the four circumstances which are unbecoming for you. Equally, my lords, the statute as it stands does identify significant of them intoxication, unnatural conduct. Cruel conduct, all of which are defined, but we are not going into that discussion today. My concern no, arises. That's another thing. No, 497 is dealing generally, as you say, with the government, whether he is employed, not employed, etc. When you're talking about somebody who is governed by a separate set of rules, as a, because it's an exhaustive court, as Brother Nilkuma pointed out, then when you enter into employment, it's not a contractual affair, as you know. You, you are elevated to the status of, there is a status too. Definitely. Where you are a member of the army. When you become a member of the army police or the armed forces, there is a, this aspect of the discipline that you have to follow. So therefore, as part of the discipline, what is what constitutes separate offenses and the various because they have taken care after providing for civil offense under 69 to also provide for unbecoming conduct. So, 69, you bring in 497. It may not be a That's a civil offense. Now, the civil offense needs to be. So, it cannot be there also not lying on. But if that prevent them from relying upon unbecoming conduct, for the purpose of maintaining discipline in the army. See, the whole thing is somebody who is not employed at all, he is free to go have adulterous relations with whatever. He doesn't have any repercussions outside of his life, individual life. A person who is subject to the discipline of the art forces is not similarly circumstance. Because what he does, what he does not do, has a repercussion on. The entire unit, right? Entire unit, and not only entire unit, possibly the country, way the to the country itself, because it relates to the discipline that you maintain, and also yes, it is not 
you know, there the other problem was there about the gender partiality. Here it is gender neutral because the word his can always be under the influence of the uh, officer can be read as uh, including a female. Now it will say his. You read 45, it says that Sir. officer his. Under the influence of the act, you can make it her also. So, irrespective of who does it, whichever officer does it. Because it is not becoming content. My lords, yeah. we are today. So, and I have a problem not, with that. No, my lords. I different don't, setting. No, my lords. I don't have a problem on that count. Yeah. And the reason I am not addressing that point is very simply that I today am not entering into whether a conduct, adulterous conduct is becoming or not. It is, personally speaking, it is not becoming conduct. It has been recognized as a moral wrong. It is wrong, therefore, it forms a ground for divorce. Otherwise, it would not form ground for divorce. All that, my lords, I was requesting is this. When my lords dispose of this clarification application, observing that the Joseph Shine judgment did not have cause to look at any of these statutes, my lords may additionally clarify that in the where these provisions are sought to be applied, they would be applied on the facts and circumstances of these, those cases without reference to section 497. <coughs> 497 comes in only in 69. What? 69, they are not invoking. They are not invoking 497. What they are seeking to invoke are the principles of 497. Yes. For the purpose of maintaining discipline in the army. Mm. Not for regulating your uh, private life. Not for 97 it, in its uh, form, it was reflected in the Indian penal. A distinction between somebody who is employed, not employed. The first distinction. The second distinction, the nature of your employment. If you are employed in a sensitive, highly sensitive uh, force like the armed forces, you would have a, an exalted, elevated level of, you know, the standards. My lords are up. Which, is, which are geared to actually achieve a particular object, which nobody can question. My lords, I don't question. I come Correct. from a family of service personnel, so I don't question. That's good. The reason why I'm pointing out what I was pointing out is this, that the premise of the application is to ensure that the family of service personnel are not engaging in untoward behavior. It Correct. is that the family of the service personnel posted at the borders are not engaging in untoward behavior. That is the premise of the application. It is not my premise. It is categorically stated to be so. If the premise is that, you know, the, the, the person, I mean, who's the aspect? If you just check up, if you just see the figures, the man, W, the wife, and X, the husband. These are the three characters in 497. Yes, my husband. Correct? If you juxtapose that in the context of 43 and uh, I mean 45 and 63, uh, how would you do it? There is a man who is working in the army at the office. Yes, ma'am. He has an affair with W, the wife of somebody else, and then the husband or the family whom he represents under 198. The RPC or the 198 says only the husband. Only the husband can come here. That also struck down. Yes, my lords, because that's a consequential really. That's, that's right. That's right. Now, here that 198 right with 497 scenario is not relevant. 69 is no longer relevant because 497 is no longer part no, no, of life. What, what you're saying is, see, when, what does 497 say? That when an offense is committed, not anyone can go and complain. Only the husband, husband can. who can go and complain. In recognition of the shackle principle. Correct. So, some, it, uh, does it require for the applicability of 69 when it was, uh, when 497 was on the statute book, that actually a prosecution must be commenced or a complaint must be filed by the husband? Complaints or is it the assumption that it comes to the knowledge of the army that uh, an incident has taken place? My lords, incidentally. Not required. It may not be required. Incidentally, a complaint was made by the husband. The complaint has been committed. Mm. See, the 497 read with 198 is for the purpose of setting the criminal law in motion. Yes, ma'am. The only person who can do it is only the husband. Yes, ma'am. As well as the armed forces, I mean, Army Act uh, invoking 69, it's only that offense is committed. Yes, ma'am. 
no. nothing to do with the enforcement of you know the, the, the right with the husband to uh, he may or he may not and he may quit he may say i don't want to you know take this matter to court i may forgive her i can condone it which my learned friend anyway indicated that it will still continue to be an arm of becoming cut it but that has nothing to do with the adultery as an offense under phone that's right that's right because therefore the therefore the context of uh, you know even 497 is completely different when it is transplanted and when it is operated within the four walls of the army and um, um, army act or navy act it's got a different repercussion different connotation because your conduct as you said very fairly because you are from the army and your family also you say then what you do you are actually the public figure not a private life somebody's private life alone you are actually commanding a, a particular unit you take it the word will go round so so fast see our man is doing it so let us also and the thing is that it is infectious see But, what is immoral what is immoral what is wrong what is good you may be you know relative values but in the armed forces you have a particular discipline so why because you are the nation might be confronted with a war at any time at any stage if you are going to have an army where you know you have completely loose morals when you say okay sab chalta hai my lord it's actually what will happen to the discipline of the army my lord, think of it i don't think that that's the either the mandate of the okay. judgment in joseph shine or a statement that i am making for the respondents that is why actually why we be say that it is not concerned with uh, 45 or 63 which is a truism which what you are saying is not anything which is wrong <clears throat> as a matter of fact it's men that's obviously it is yes my lords that and the, if my lords can still consider putting in a sentence that as and when these provisions are sought to be invoked they would be invoked taking into consideration the facts and circumstances of individual case actually they can do it only in that way can they take it uh, as uh, some kind of a general euclid uh, theorem that my lord it is actually it, is, it should be it should be done on the basis of the facts and each my lord it's the both are broad provisions they are actually invoked in almost each and every case along with other provisions because they are broad every conduct whether it is a breach of any other provision also is good. let's say it's a case of intoxication it will always invoke 45 and 63 because that conduct will if it's a offense under your statute it is a conduct that is considered to be unbecoming so the provisions are invoked in each and every case almost as a matter of course therefore my lords it's a request if my lords would consider while disposing of that it may be clarified that the invocation would be on the facts and circumstances of each case and not as a matter of course so miss ghosh i don't think uh, the joseph sign judgment i mean if you leave aside you know four different judgments written what it has done it has simply decriminalized section 497 yes. whatever the act that is envisaged under section 497 that has been decriminalized right it's no more a criminal act now suppose any conduct of a person belonging to the armed forces are coming within what is prohibited under 45 and 63 and paramilitary provision that is not being taken away you have agreed to that no you have agreed to it right so if such a clarification is given without the additional clarification you see that it will apply to each facts that is not necessary at all why why is it necessary because if they put a man in the armed forces on charge of committing breach of 45 and 63 without bringing in what was contemplated in 497 how you are prejudiced or how your client the client that you are representing is prejudiced my lords my submission is only this that it may be recognized that it has to be on the facts and circumstances of the cases no, that is otherwise also any promiscuous act because end of the day when it comes down to 45 and 63 those any act that is complained of must necessarily have a relationship with the duties they are required to discharge and military discipline that they will still have to establish it cannot be that this order is shown and said that this order permits us to invoke and we have therefore invoke without 
showing the necessary nexus between the military discipline concern and the good order, which they still have to establish. The oh, that the, say that though you are, you are slightly on different minds. You have coming a little bit. So, what Joseph Stein says is decriminalization of good anti Nothing addition further. We are talking about armed forces. Let us take in general. This discipline is required everywhere where you serve. In any capacity you serve. Now, if your conduct is unbecoming a conduct to serve the institution, wherever you serve, and the authority in its wisdom within the parameters of unbecoming conduct of an employee or an officer holds you guilty without aid of 497. And according to the service jurisprudence, they say, sorry, this according to us is this relation is unbecoming conduct of an individual. Why can't, where is the restraint come from the judgment? Nothing. There is no restraint from the judgment. No, in fact, that's our position. No, no criminal action can be taken against you, an individual, whether in armed force somewhere. But I if, see criminal action. but no, no, not criminal. They are taking the action under their own law. <coughs> under their own and law, which permits them. Which, if they are able to establish that a conduct in question impacts military discipline and good order of the services. Which in different words are provided for in the three statutes. That's correct. And they take action under their own law. They are taking action under their own law as if. There is no quarrel on that, my lords. We are concerned about our apprehension is that a clarification would allow them to override the requirements of looking at the mandate. You are presupposing something which is still not there. We will come back after that. Who's been two one five two one five two one two fifteen two fifteen.